I want to detail kind of what's going on and then start to offer some thoughts around you know, how we might tackle these, both for ourselves and for the clients uh, that we work with and for. Uh, and so the four are around success, uh, around action or activity, fitting in, and then experts or expertise, really. And so the challenge is, um, you know, if we look at kind of the first letter of each, that in playing it safe, it often gets in the way of learning. And so we want to understand why these are so problematic, right? By themselves, as we look at these, you know, success is good, action, we need uh, to make progress, we want to fit in, we're trained to do so from a young age, we need experts, they help us to proceed. Um, but all too often, um, this stops us individually and it stops our organizations. So let's dive into uh, to each one. And we can start with the success bias. And so, you know, when we first say this one, even to myself, right, uh, I have a bias for success. We kind of have this moment of, you know, yes, yes, I do. Uh, uh, that uh, we kind of view that clearly as a good thing, right? Success is positive. Success means we're making progress. Um, and to an extent, that's true. Unfortunately, in all too many organizations, that focus on getting everything right, never seeing mistakes, never having something goes wrong, means that we fail to innovate, we fail to learn, right? Learning inherently means that we've changed something, that something has led to an outcome that's different. Um, eventually, hopefully, that's a positive story, but kind of the key issue here is that if we're always being successful, then we're not pushing those boundaries nearly far enough. Now, the question is kind of what's really going on? Why do these problems occur? So we can start with the success bias of our challenge of the fear of failure, right? While many organizations give lip service to, you know, yes, we fail fast, failure is appropriate, you know, all's good, you need to try different things, that in reality, um, it doesn't work that way. Things go wrong, your promotion disappears. Things go wrong, that bonus you thought you were going to get, right? You get graded down a category. Um, that instead uh, of dealing with failure in a way that lets us learn, we simply sweep it under the rug, right? I think the best study that I've seen on this topic um, is now a great learning scholar, Amy Edmondson, but back very early in her career. She was studying hospitals. She had a really simple idea as a doctoral student. She thought great leaders have teams that make fewer errors, right? It's the sort of thing that a doctoral student would come up with, right? We kind of all look at that, and okay, good job. You know, I'm glad you showed what we already knew, um, but you have to start somewhere. Research is hard. So she went out and she collected data. She did scales on leadership behaviors that we would all look at, kind of nod our head. Yep, yep, that's, that's important. Um, she collected data on the errors, um, and then she went back, she ran a regression. And her model, really simple. Good leadership, fewer errors. Should be a negative coefficient. Ran the model, came back positive. Good leaders had teams that made more errors. Okay, well, dirty little secret. As academics, we make mistakes sometimes, right? There could be a problem here. She went, she re-ran the data, recoded it. Um, coefficients positive blaring. She went and she talked to folks, right? Why am I seeing this result? Um, and they kind of gave her that same look. Well, of course you're seeing that result, right? If we think about, you know, in a hospital with nursing teams, frankly, in most of our contexts, the mistakes that we make are self-reported things, right? If I want to keep it to myself, no one has to know about it, right? And so what was happening, those great leaders it's not that they inherently had teams that made more mistakes. It's that people were willing to speak up about it, right? Um, and so she labeled that idea psychological safety, right? Which has now gotten a lot uh, of appropriate press. Google just recently did a study on psychological safety. Actually, they did a study on project team performance. They wanted to show what led to great project performance. They named this code uh, Project Aristotle. Uh, because it's Google, so everything needs you know, an important sounding name. Um, in this case, Project Aristotle, because we want the whole to be greater than the sum of its parts. They looked at things like your education. They looked at kind of your intellectual ability, your background, you know, all the things, what school you went to. None of that really mattered much. The dominant predictor of team performance was whether there was a psychologically safe environment. Were people willing to take risks um, within the context of the team? Why? Because then they could overcome this fear of failure. But without setting that up, then we sweep things under the rug, we keep it to ourselves, we fail to learn, and certainly no one else is going to learn because they're not going to see it either. The second issue I want to talk about is, is how we view intelligence. 
So I used to read my kids the little engine that could, right? And the little engine I could came around initially in the early 20th century, folktale, um, and a wonderful story, right? I think I can, I think I can. It's sort of, you know, Disney movie-ish, right? I think I can, and then, then the engine does, right? So we can all be happy as the toys are brought to the other side of the mountain. But it turns out there's actually a great deal of science that sits underneath this. And it goes back to how we view intelligence. A number of scholars have looked at this. Carol Dweck uh, has really done foundational work in the area. Uh, but what she found was that there are two broad different categorizations for how we view intelligence. Right? Some folks view it as fixed. Right? We simply have a given amount. There's only so much intelligence that any one of us has. And so our job is to effectively deploy that. Right? Let's use it to the best of our abilities. Other people, though, view it not as a fixed quantity, but rather as something that can expand, something that can grow. Now, what's incredibly exciting is that research tells us, yes, it can grow. And while we all have differences in kind of our innate view of how we might view this, is it fixed, um, is it growth, that actually it's not just an underlying trait, it's something we can change. We can help people understand that it can grow. Now, why is this so fundamental? Well, it actually ties to success and failure, right? If you have that fixed view and you fail, what is it telling you? It's telling you there's something wrong with you, right? I don't have enough intelligence to solve this problem, right? Well, then we're back to I better sweep it away, I better move to something simpler. Instead, if, you know what, I don't have enough to do it yet, but if I keep going, then I can. And so subsequent work has shown that it actually affects how we view process and outcome. That when we have that growth perspective, when we encourage that focus on the process, then we're able to learn, then we're able to improve. The initial work was done within education, within students. So parents in the room may have read this with your own kids. When you focus just on the outcome, then people get very narrow. They actually don't then tend to put in as much subsequent effort uh, as they're simply you know, trying to deliver that you know, 90 that's going to get them an A. When you focus on the growth, this point that, hey, what was the process you followed, right? What was your failure along the way? Then we see a chance for things to expand. We see a chance for things to get better. We see a chance for folks to learn. Subsequent work has been done uh, within Fortune 500 companies. A study of seven Fortune 500 companies found that growth mindset uh, was related to better employee engagement, better employee performance. Um, in addition, when we get into the underlying science, there's been some really cool recent work looking at functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRIs, basically pictures of the brain, what's going on in the brain. Um, and what that shows is after failure, if you have a fixed mindset, you activate less of your brain to move forward than if you have a growth mindset. So the little engine that could actually had it right with I think I can, with recognizing there's more that I can do, we activate a power source within our bodies, right? We activate more of our brain. We activate more of those around us, and so we're able to learn. What do we need to do here? We have to focus not just on that outcome, right? Did I succeed or fail? What was the process I used to get there and how I can move forward? So as we think about the success bias, you know, we can look at kind of two different areas. First is around teaching a growth mindset. So the good news um, is that you know, we can improve upon this. Narratives matter. Um, neat uh, research and education showing that you know, the stories you tell people changes how they respond. One group were told about great geniuses and their amazing accomplishments. Another group was told about the great genius's struggle. So Albert Einstein, yes, you know, we know the theory of relativity, but when he had a hard time, he went to Max Planck, right? He had struggles. He couldn't figure things out the first time. As students were told about those two different versions, here are the geniuses here, are the same geniuses, but guess what? They struggle. Their scores in math and science um, improved, right? They scored at higher rates. They also saw higher trajectory, better learning. In business, that has been used. Peter Heslin at Michigan State done some really cool studies, field experiments, working with organizations, taking people, dividing them into two groups. One group gets standard training. One group uh, gets uh, training around a growth mindset. Subsequently tracked how they did. They performed better as managers. They were more likely to see the best in their employees. They're more likely then to have their employees perform, uh, not only engage, but perform at a higher level for them. So we have to think about how can we shift that mindset. Yeah. The other piece is we have to think about ways to destigmatize failure. 
One of my favorite stories is from a fast food company I've done some work with. Tom Crosby, the CEO there, had a great idea for product development. They were burger and fries place, uh, sweet tea, uh, and uh, he said, we need salads. People want to eat healthier. Everybody said, Tom, we don't need salads. Nobody wants to eat healthy at Pals. Uh, they want to eat burger and fries. Nope, we need salads. On and on like this, finally, hey, he's the CEO, right? He can make it happen, and he did. Six months in, the best-selling salad, which didn't sell that well, was the cheeseburger salad. <laughs> Nobody wanted to go uh, to the firm to eat uh, salads. And so, you know, when it uh, had gone wrong, when they pulled the salad line, he stood out in front of everybody and said, hey, guess what? That was a half million dollars that I just spent on my education. I've now spent several million dollars as the CEO of this company. Oh, by the way, highest sales per square foot, highest profits per square foot in quick service, uh, arguably in retail at all. So massive uh, performance, great organization. But, you know, guess what? I failed. That's how I learn. His view is that anyone in the organization, as long as it's not illegal, immoral, unethical, you get to fail once. But next time, you better make it another mistake, not the same one, right? We can't keep doing the same wrong thing over and over again. But if we're constantly changing those mistakes we're making, thinking that it's moving us in the right direction, right? We're failing fast. We're sharing it in a productive way. So that's the success bias. Second bias I want to talk about is the action bias. When something happens, when something goes wrong, it's a little bit like you know, the alarm going off in the fire department, right? Um, bells start ringing, lights start flashing. And so what do we do? Well, we slide down the pole, we get our gear on, we hop on the truck, and we go out and we fight the fire, right? Our first response is action. Our first response is to do something. And of course, many times, that's perfectly appropriate. With each of these biases, it's not that they're categorically a bad thing. Um, it's that there's a balance, and all too often we push it too far. Kind of one of the best examples I've seen of this comes from the world of sports. So if we look at soccer, football if you prefer, depending on where you grew up, that penalty kicks. There's a study looking at what's the optimal strategy for goalies. Right? Penalty kick, ball gets set out in front of the goal. Uh, offense player is going to come up and strike the ball. Goalie has to stay on the line until the ball gets struck, then has a decision to make. Right? Do I dive to the left? Do I dive to the right? Goalie's thinking about, right, perhaps some data they've looked at of what's this player's tendency, perhaps that glint in the eye that's screaming they're going to go left. Or goalie actually has the third choice. Goalie can stay exactly where they are, right? Goalie doesn't have to dive. Now, challenge of not diving is if they have a perfect kick out to the side, you're not going to make it in time. By the time that offensive player commits, it's too late for you to get all the way there. But you can get partway there. Also, maybe the player kicks the ball right back up the middle, you're ready to scoop it up. Now, it turns out players only stay in the middle 6% of the time, but about a third of the kicks go there. If you do the calculations, the optimal strategy for a goalie is to stay put. Now, there's a little bit of game theory and some dynamics. You'd say you need to dive every so often to keep them honest, but overall, um, the optimal strategy is to stay put. Goalies don't do it, though. St uh, researchers went back and asked them, well, if this is optimal, right, we can show you the data, you can agree, right, they, data made sense to them, why don't you do it? Well, if they score a goal and I'm standing there, kind of twiddling my thumbs, right, how am I going to feel about it? I'm going to have a whole lot of regret. If I dove, my face is covered in mud, you know, I've got dirt, you know, I'm kind of pulling the grass out, well, I did everything I could, right? Who's going to yell at me, oh, damn it, Brad, why'd you go left, right? Yeah, you know what, 50-50, I guessed the wrong way this time. All too often, we have the same challenge in our organizations, right? We want to be seen doing something, even though that doing something gets in the way of our learning. So uh, kind of with the action bias, what are the challenges that it creates? And I want to highlight four, um, kind of two within each of these broader categories. You know, the first is that we're in this challenge of busyness. We have so much going on that we don't have any space then in our worlds to think, right? Um, and so Margaret mentioned this hand hygiene study that we've done. And so we've done a number of things around it. It's a study working with a company that had radio frequency identification. Uh, and so they set up systems in hospitals. They put badges on the caregivers. They then have uh, sensors on the uh, sanitizing agent dispenser. Um, if actually you learn nothing else from today, the one thing I'm about to say could save your life, which is make sure if you're in the hospital, you ask your care provider to wash 
his or her hands. Uh, you're doing yourself or your loved one a favor. Uh, learning super important. Living arguably more important. Uh, so do that. Uh, but you know, when we look at uh, hand hygiene compliance, we see it hovers around 50% right, across the world. Um, exceptionally low on average, given that this is the single best predictor of whether you're going to get a hospital-acquired infection. Things that typically are often kill us and are always very expensive for us to address uh, within the healthcare system. Now, one of the things we looked at was this kind of exhaustion busyness story. We looked over the course of the day, a 12-hour shift for a nurse. On average, what happened to her hand hygiene compliance? On average, it fell. It fell nine absolute percentage points. Right, from 59 all the way down to 50%. They didn't realize this was happening, right? but this was going on in the background. Research in context after context shows us as we get exhausted, right, our performance plummets. When we're tired, when we're not getting enough sleep, it's often as bad or worse than if we were driving drunk, trying to make decisions at our desk um, after you know, throwing down a few shots. Right? Pretty sure most of our organizations would have a problem with that, and yet you know, we don't worry about things like our general exhaustion. Also, when we're too busy, we fail to think ahead. So I was with uh, an organization recently uh, that had just uh, been through a big change. Uh, and so they, I didn't realize when I got there, I thought I was just looking at uh, some engagement issues that they were having. Um, and so I went out to talk to the frontline uh, personnel. Um, and as I was talking to these uh, knowledge workers, highly paid knowledge workers, um, kind of time after time they complained to me about how just recently, the company had restructured their workday. These were doctors. And they had taken away their ability to block their own schedules. Um, that now this was going to be managed centrally. So even if I knew a patient was coming, I couldn't block a spot for them. Or I needed a little extra time for this today. Nope, we're going to manage you very tightly. And when this news that was inevitably going to be a challenge to uh, roll out uh, was sent out to uh, folks in an email, um, that email said, if you have any questions, talk to your frontline supervisor. Okay? Talk to your frontline supervisor. They went to talk to their frontline supervisor. Their response, huh, first I heard of it, right? Um, OK, that's suboptimal. Then I went and I was talking to the president of the organization. And she was asking me kind of what I'd learned, what had come up. And I said, well, you know, I, I didn't know about this, but every conversation, this, this has come up. And she kind of rolled her eyes and said, this happened six months ago. How long are they going to talk about it? Well, I think, you know, again and again and again until something more fundamentally changes within the organization and how they approach things, right? This was a great individual. She had very good intentions, trying to do right by you know, her doctors and their patients. And when I asked her, you know, why didn't this happen in a way that tried not to sound, you know, that kind of how could you possibly not think of this, uh, kind of her response was, we were busy, right? We meant to talk to the first line supervisors. We never got to it. So when we have too much going on, right, things simply fall through the cracks. Right? We're not able to keep all those balls juggling. And unfortunately, if we're trying to juggle everything, you know, it's often important stuff that uh, falls to the ground and maybe crashes. Second difficulty around the action bias comes um, as we think about reflection. Now, kind of in a really simple way, if we want to learn, we need to do new stuff, and then we need to think about it. Right? So I try something out. I try that new pharmaceutical you know, kind of, uh, you know, NPD project. Um, or how I work with the team and engage with them, you know, how I write the code, whatever it might be. Something happens, I step back and I look, did it work, did it not, why, why not, et cetera. And so kind of we go through action, reflection, action, reflection. Unfortunately, as we get too busy, you know, we often push aside the reflection, right? And so it's simply act, 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 act. Um, another study that uh, I did kind of in that me search domain had to do with reflection. And so I'll admit that uh, when uh, I was kind of in practitioner shoes and I went to classes that had things like learning journals, that was typically when I rolled my eyes, right? Um, if you were going to check it you know, and grade me on it, say I was in the MBA program or at least somebody was going to read it, then I'd do it, but I wouldn't do it very happily, right? Um, and then suddenly I found myself in the front of the room kind of speaking as an authority of here's your learning journal. Even I could see a little bit of hypocrisy that was there, um, and that uh, perhaps uh, I should look into this. Uh, and so uh, I worked with a technology services company. And with a couple colleagues, we had a really simple idea. They had a six-week training program. And so at the end of that six weeks, people took a technical exam that they had to pass to move on uh, and do their jobs. And so we took the two weeks in the middle, week three and four, 15 minutes at the end of each day. And so we randomly assigned folks into different groups. For now, we'll focus just on kind of two key groups. 
One was a control group. They went through exactly the same training they'd always had. The other group, we took the last 15 minutes of the day, right? So think, you know, 4.45 to 5 o'clock. Um, and we gave them a little, you know, learning journal. We gave them, kind of think of it as an exam blue book. And we asked them each day, write about two things that you learned today. Two things. So we did that in weeks three and four. Then they subsequently took the exam in week six, and they went on. They were doing technical service, so support mostly by phone. Um, as we looked at the data, they performed at about 25% higher rate uh, on uh, that final technical exam. They passed that technical exam at about the same rate, um, so much uh, higher and a significant difference between the two groups. Then they performed at about a 10% higher rate their first month in the job. Right? Really simple idea here, and yet that's how powerful reflection can be. Why? Well, one, it just helps us solidify what we've learned. Right? We've got a bunch of things swimming around up here. When do we take the time to connect the pieces? The other is it actually helps us recognize how much we, learn, how much we know. Um, that confidence matters in learning, and so it helps us build self-confidence. And so both of these were at play. Better knowledge, better self-confidence, better results. All too often, though, we don't want to reflect. We follow this with a bunch of lab experiments, things as simple as, you know, give somebody a choice. I'll teach you something new. You do it for a while. Then I'll say, hey, here are five minutes. You can keep doing that new activity, or you can reflect on it. Overall, we almost always go down that path of, let me do it some more. Um, and then we see the results, and that group that reflected, even in a lab, even doing simplistic activities, We've done stuff in a French cooking school. That was pretty cool. Uh, and uh, they all show the same path, right? That when we reflect, at least up to a point, not suggesting we all need to go you know, spend the next week reflecting necessarily, but that small moments of reflection can have really profound impact on our performance. And so as we think about the action bias and how to proceed, um, then there are a number of steps that we can take. First is around breaks making sure that we've actually looked at the structure of our day, right? When we think about kind of when, where, and what, you know, when is more often than you think, where is almost certainly not at your desk, um, and what is something that helps you disengage from the activity typically, right? Whether that's looking at breaks, we've done work in kind of knowledge services. We did breaks looking in tomato harvesting. We had a really nice uh, setting there that people sometimes, there wouldn't be a tomato trailer for them, so they couldn't keep working. They got an unexpected break, right? Got a few minutes, five, 10 minutes as they waited for the new tomato trailer to get brought to the field. Turned out, even losing that time harvesting, overall their performance improved. Why? Because those little short breaks matter quite a bit, right? Um, Dan Pink, I think it's actually today that his book comes out uh, looking at when, right? When is really a story of these two things, right? Um, as he's trying to look at the structure of your workday. There's a whole lot of behavioral science that I and others have looked at um, that he kind of ties together really nicely to think about you know, work design, right? That turns out you know, an eight-hour workday five days a week is an artifact, well, it wasn't eight back then, but it's an artifact of a much older system. Is it the right system for a learning economy? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. We need to look at it in our own context. Leading by example matters a whole lot. Um, and that stretches across, you know, here I'm talking um, at the moment, or I have talked uh, a little bit more about the immediate uh, things. If you stretch this out a little bit more, we think about vacations, the importance of stepping away from the job, uh, the fact that you know, we are humans, we have you know, kind of need for, uh, for some time uh, to recharge, whether that's at night, whether that's over weekends, whether that's longer vacations. You know, finding ways to do each of those things. Modeling that as a leader, right? Um, that I think many of us you know, are trained to think the speed at which we respond to an email um, shows how committed we are to a job, right? And that's, no, you know, that's particularly true on the weekend uh, if we can show why, yes, at 2.24 p.m. I did respond to your email. Um, recognizing that, you know, especially as a leader, we may need to model different behaviors, right? We may actually need to use that option button. If we can't help ourselves from responding, then go ahead and respond, but set it not to go out until 8 a.m. on Monday morning, right? Um, showing people that it's okay to step back you know, for their broader life, uh, but also for their learning objectives. Um, I think as we look at structuring the workday, right, you know, there's a chance to, you know, kind of during the day, we did some work looking at commutes. People are miserable. Um, kind of the thing they hate most uh, in their workday tends to be uh, the commute to work. The thing they hate third most um, is uh, the commute to home from work. Uh, and so uh, we looked at a really simple change. What if on your commutes, 
We simply nudge you to think about your day, to do a little bit of planning. Um, could that help you uh, be a bit happier? Could that help you engage a bit more? Could that help you learn? Yeah, it does. Um, so next time you're driving into work, right, take that five minutes. Okay, what's going on today? How am I going to structure the day? Creates a little bit of a transition in uh, setting you up for success. Um, across the week, a number of organizations have done things like set up no meeting Fridays. Um, that we're going to block that time. Um, makes it a pain in the ass when you're working with that company to try to find time to meet and Fridays are your good day, but nevertheless, um, it has some great benefits uh, for, uh, for overall getting work done and for learning. Thinking about at the end of work, are we making sure that we're reflecting, right? Combining uh, things uh, after action reviews that we talked about. Uh, what uh, might go wrong? Perhaps the best way, or excuse me, what did we learn uh, and how can we proceed? How I'd tie it all together with some advice that I got from a mentor of mine uh, kind of early in my career. Uh, I was in his office. I was flying through things a mile a minute. I didn't get a lot of time from him, so I really wanted to use it well. Um, probably not that hard to believe that I'm um, somewhat easily excitable uh, and can talk really fast uh, if uh, I'm not held back. Uh, and so I was fun and th spinning through things until you know, I took a breath and he put a hand on my shoulder and looked me in the eye and said, Brad, don't avoid thinking by being busy. And so if we want to learn, we have to think about how we're setting ourselves and how we're setting those that we work with up so that they don't avoid thinking by being busy. You know, from a young age, we are taught to fit in, whether that's sitting in kindergarten, whether that's a part of our sports teams or the groups, whether that's with our friends, right? It's that we're supposed to fit in. We're supposed to be like the others. We're supposed to not stick out, right? And this flows all the way into organizational life. Um, this Dilbert is one that I cut out um, back when I was still working in industry because um, it struck me as getting at some sort of a fundamental truth. I didn't really kind of you know, think that someday I would do research around it, um, but it seemed to kind of capture how I felt like all too many organizations worked. Um, and you know, as we looked at this, we've come to appreciate that there are a bunch of reasons why organizations want conformity and a bunch of good reasons, frankly. Right? Think about you know, as we come into organizations, onboarding is a great you know, time to look at. Right? And so when I went to Wall Street as a 22-year-old, uh, I'd been trained as an engineer, so I didn't really know finance. Um, you know, I'm trying to figure out how do I you know, not stick out. Right? Uh, I'm embarrassed enough that I don't know what uh, these words are that they're using yet. You know, I put on my gray pinstripe suit. Um, I tried to learn the language as I talked about, you know, making apples to apples comparisons. At the end of the day, the synergy would justify sufficient value such that the merger uh, would be, you know, accretive uh, and uh, kind of took on that role, right? And so when we join an organization, that sort of fitting in makes sense, right? You know, I wanted to fit in. I didn't want to stand out. For the organization, they got control. Um, they were able to make sure that, you know, things didn't get uh, too rocky. Um, and that's how it typically works. Right, assuming that kind of if we look at onboarding, it's not just a, oh, by the way, you're here, but that's a whole other story. Uh, that you know, we're typically pushing the organization. Right? And so there's been a lot of work around this showing that kind of like a sculptor's mold, many organizations' onboarding process, even though they take different inputs, when you come out the other side, kind of you've been kerchunked into something that looks you know, just like everyone else. Think about something like uh, you know, basic training in the US Army, uh, Traditions 101 uh, at, uh, at Disney number of kind of great examples here. The challenge, right, um, when we bring people in, they're fitting in, they're looking like everybody else, that conformity, well, then you know, we're not getting their individual contribution. I love this quote from Steve Jobs, right? It doesn't make sense to hire smart people and tell them what to do. We hire smart people so they can tell us what to do, right? Increasingly, if we need to learn, if we need to improve, if we need to change, then it's not about bringing somebody in and telling you, hey, you give me your hands, I'll tell you how to use them, you move them in these ways, and ta-da, the work gets done. Instead, it's we've got to engage your unique brain. We've got to, as well, increasingly engage your heart. Um, and so if we're not focusing on the individual, if we're not finding ways to help you basically uh, rebel within the organization, at least somewhat constructively, um, then we're inherently going to limit our ability to learn. Second dimension within fitting in um, comes around kind of our strengths. So, um, you know, I'm sure in this room we kind of all know uh, the uh, statistics uh, as we look at uh, Gallup's been doing this for years, kind of engagement in organizations, you know, around a third of folks, depending on the year to year, moves a little bit, are actually engaged. 
right? That's the sort of thing that if you just look at it and don't pause to think, um, kind of you're horrified by, uh, and then you start to ponder the organizations that you've seen, and you're, okay, maybe that's about right, right, unfortunately. Uh, um, and so, you know, what's, what's so interesting to me about kind of that engagement um, is this question right here, another one from Gallup, uh, that they found is one of the most significant predictors of whether someone is engaged, right? At work, do you have the opportunity to do what you do best every day? Do you use your strengths? Now, why are strengths so fundamentally important? Well, it starts that they're motivating, that they're engaging, right? Um, that if we think about you know, what matters uh, for, uh, for motivation, we know that uh, an ability to master things is one thing that gets us going. It's one thing that you know, helps me want to get up and work in the morning. Um, and so when we play to our strengths, we have an ability to you know, improve that area of mastery um, and push it even further along. Um, when we use our strengths, other good things can happen. So we did some work uh, with some experiments uh, having people use strengths versus not. Uh, we actually found that uh, the antibody SIG-A uh, was increased for those who used their strengths. SIG-A uh, is strongly related to whether you're going to get a cold. Uh, so your health actually improved as you used your strengths. Um, so we use our strengths. It also helps us to learn, right? As an expert, uh, in this way, we're more likely to see connections. We're more likely to put the pieces together. Um, and when we use our strengths, then we also um, can be more creative. Uh, so we did some work around that too, helping people see their strengths um, and then doing subsequent creativity tasks afterwards. Now, I think what's so fascinating um, on this particular dimension is it runs counter to kind of many of the ways we often think about you know, how things work in, in organizations, right? Take standard feedback processes, right? In many organizations I spent time with, you know, we look at the end of the year at what happened, right? Things that went right, things that went wrong. We'll give you a nice little feedback sandwich. We'll tell you some good stuff, right? Then we'll you know, lower the boom. Uh, we'll really you know, take you out with all the things that went wrong uh, and uh, that you need to improve upon. And then we'll try to close things with a little, but wait, you know, this actually went well, and we'll kind of pat you on the back and we'll move on. Right? And that's flawed in a couple of ways. Um, it's flawed simply in a delivery method. Uh, so it turns out if we go back kind of to the failure point, you know, we struggle when others share with us, went wrong, with, with us what went wrong. Um, we actually try, unfortunately, all too often to hide from it. Uh, and so when we lower the boom uh, and, uh, and focus our attention there, we're often not listening anymore. We're coming up with uh, explanations. Uh, we may not even remember all the details that was so long ago. So we actually need to think about the structure of our feedback process. Um, it also often puts us you know, heading down the wrong path, right? That you know, we have things that have gone wrong that we're now trying to fix, that it's not clear we can, and it's certainly not clear that we should. Right? So in my own context, um, I look back at this as when I came out of my MBA program, um, I was looking at uh, two, two jobs. I was trying to decide between going into consulting, um, had a job uh, with McKinsey, uh, or going into venture capital. And I laid out all of the different explanations for each. If I went to McKinsey, it would let me use my analytical skills, it would let me work with others, let me gain some deep understanding, all things that I passionately loved and thought I was pretty good at. Over here on VC, as I looked at it, um, I knew I would learn new things. It would also force me for the firm I was going to to cold call, force me to build selling skills. Um, that, you know, that firm I would spend three days out of a week on the road, I'd be going around meeting entrepreneurs, meeting bankers, meeting lawyers, meeting accountants, things that, you know, the grand scheme of things, you ask me, you know, go into a new setting, meet lots of new people, I'd rank that and at the bottom. Um, but, you know, as I thought about where the career was going to take me, I thought, well, I want, you know, might want to be an entrepreneur someday. I've got to solve this problem of, hey, I'm not a good seller. If I'm going to do this, I've got to fix that. So as I weighed these back and forth, eventually that's actually what pulled me into the realm of the VC, that I have this core weakness that I'm going to go fix. Now the challenge, um, as time played out, I was fine. I wasn't the world's worst VC. I certainly wasn't the world's best, you know, note back in academia. Uh, but it was part of this realization here that I was actually not playing to my strengths. I was trying to fix a weakness that was irrelevant. You know, I'm never going to be the world's greatest Cutco knife salesman. Um, and that's OK, right? Door-to-door -door sales is never going to be where my strengths are. Now, it turns out there are certain things I can sell. Relationship selling, selling, we spend a lot of time. We work back and forth, back to that, collaborating, using the deep analytical skills. You know, that's where I play well. 
And so I came to this appreciation, right, that, you know, how should I be doing things? Well, I actually should be playing to my strengths. The same thing as an organization. Take, you know, one of the world's great retailers, Zara. Why is Zara one of the world's great retailers? Because they've put together a system, an operating system, that allows them to quickly um, identify what, what's most fashionable and get it to their stores so you can buy it rapidly, right? And they do it at a price that's acceptable. Now, to do that, they've got a number of core weaknesses. They produce their product in Europe. That's expensive, right? They build shoddy product. You're only going to wear it three or four times, right? You know, this shirt kind of laughs uh, at the concept of only being worn three or four times, right? And so if Zara fit, looked to try to fix those weaknesses, right? Nope, let's send it to China. Nope, let's buy kind of better materials that are going to last longer. They'd solve a problem, but create entirely new ones, right? They recognize their strengths, fast fashion, meant we have to have slightly higher costs because we're in Europe. We're going to have slightly cheaper material because guess what? Most people buying our product don't care. After three or four times, they want to move on to something else too. Um, and so they played very much to those strengths. Um, here, when we fit in, right, whether it's organizationally, whether it's individually, right, We've got to be willing to put up with some weaknesses. Um, those weaknesses, if they're not core to what we're doing, um, aren't where we should be focusing our attention. So um, what do we do? Well, first is thinking about how to release the individual. How do we allow nonconformance? How do we allow positive deviance at work? Right? One of the things we did with another organization was we took their onboarding process and we changed it. We said, hey, this was a well-respected company. Uh, in technology, um, and their standard process was very much about the organization. Let's make it about the individual. We took a single hour within the first day. We brought people in. Within that hour, we then shared with them, we had them share stories about themselves. We had someone come in, talk about how they'd been able to be themselves at work, uh, a star performer. We had them introduce one in themselves to each other around a personal highlight reel. At the end of it, we gave them a fleece that had their name on it and an ID badge, or kind of a badge, uh, in addition to the ID badge that had their name on it. Um, now, you may say, well, look, any difference you pick up might just be because people like free stuff. You gave them a fleece, you gave them a badge. OK, well, we like free stuff. So we created another condition, right? We had a control, we had an individual, we had an organizational condition. They got the hour all about the organization, then they also got a fleece with the company name, a badge with the company name on it, too. We sent them all on their way. Six months later, we found that that group that got the individual treatment turned over around 30% less. Right? This was an organization that had a massive turnover problem, uh, which is why we kind of went down this path in the first place. They performed on the job at about 10% higher rate. Right? Nothing else changed except for that first hour. What were we doing? We we're highlighting the individual. We we're finding ways to engage them. So we think about this kind of idea as freedom within the frame. Right? What do we need to control? What do we leave in people's hands as a design question? Right? As much as possible, we need to design outcomes, but leave some freedom in the process. Right? Helping people understand where they're trying to get, and then allowing them to design a process that's going to accomplish that task, particularly as we get into knowledge work. Um, in addition, giving some freedom around the environment. Right? Injecting a little bit of ourselves into our offices uh, can have a pretty profound impact, right? As we put pictures uh, that are important to us, as we add splashes of color uh, to engage and help us overcome that fitting in bias. Um, second is around our strengths, right? A great tool that we've had a fair bit of success with is a Reflected Best Self tool. Reflected Best Self came out of Michigan's uh, Center for Positive Organizational Scholarship. Really simple idea. I'm going to contact 10 to 15 people that know me well, not just work, personal, background, kind of throughout my life, and have them share two or three stories of when they have seen me at my best, when they've seen me at my best. When you do this with people, if you haven't already uh, done it yourself, you know, it's often an emotional experience. A college roommate shares a story that you've forgotten. A law boss from long ago you know, is telling something that you did uh, that profoundly uh, impacted them. But it gives you a chance individually to learn your own strengths. We're often actually quite poor uh, at identifying our own strengths. Uh, we tend to overestimate certain things, ignore others. And so turning to others who know us well like this is a great way to do that. Um, we also did a big study with a global consulting firm around this. Uh, we took 1,000 uh, new joinees. We divided them up into different conditions. One was a control. One just got told, hey, think about your strengths. One went through a reflected best self-treatment. That group that got the reflected best self-treatment a year later 
more likely to be engaged, more likely to be there, less likely to report that they were burnt out, uh, that they were going to leave the firm, uh, rated higher by managers. Um, as we can find our strengths, as we can use those strengths at work, fitting in kind of in a controlled way, right? This isn't saying kind of go completely crazy. Um, you know, there is a kind of downside if we push it too far uh, that we can strike a better balance and we can learn. The final bias I want to talk about um, is around kind of expert uh, and expertise. And so, you know, if we look at uh, Frederick Taylor, Frederick Taylor, uh, kind of who uh, is known as a founder of scientific management, operations professor as well, kind of, you know, patron saint, uh, really kicked off the study of operations. Uh, uh, and uh, there's a lot to, uh, to these days have problems with some of what Taylor did. Uh, but there's also some core things to like. Right? He had a core idea that, look, any process can be improved. If we study it carefully enough, we can find things that are wrong, we can make them better. Um, and that's true across whether it's scientific management, things like total quality management, process reengineering, Six Sigma, Lean, all of these improvement kind of methodologies have a similar perspective, right? Um, that we're going to study, we're going to make it better. With the exception of Lean, though, almost all of them rely on experts. That there are going to be, there's going to be a black belt uh, who does this. There's going to be our sensei that does this. There's going to be our fill in the blank, right? And so, you know, kind of I, the enlightened one, will share with the masses how to do this, and we will all move on delightfully together. Um, now, it's not put in that uh, kind of negative of language, because then, of course, we'd see the problems with it. But perhaps if it would, it would have saved us a whole lot of trouble. Um, because you know, what we see is all too often these great projects show that initial you know, boom while we're sitting there and then backslide, uh, and they're gone or worse once the person disappears. Now, kind of what, what, what are our core issues around this bias for expertise? You know, uh, the first is that all too often we take entirely too narrow of a view of expertise. So I love the story that Malcolm Gladwell talks about in Blink, right? He's drawing on actually research around chess. Um, and the research kind of begins with a really simple idea. If I put a chessboard together, I show that chessboard to a novice just for a second. I ask them what to do. They kind of look at it afterwards. You know, what move should you make now? You know, I got nothing, right? I think uh, that little horsey thing should maybe move uh, over some. Um, instead, when you turn to the expert, you show them you know, that picture of the board you know, just for a second. Same thing. Well, we need to move now, you know, et cetera. Uh, um, they tell you exactly what move to make, even though they've just seen it for an instant. Right? And what's going on? Well, when you have that pattern of how things work, you can very quickly recognize the right steps to take. Now, by itself, that research would be published in something like the Journal of the Obvious, uh, which uh, doesn't really help one's career very much. So fortunately, uh, there's another step to it. Move the pieces around and put them in a setup that you would never see in chess, right? Something you'd never see in chess. Then show it to the novice, just for a second. Again, they're clueless, right? They were clueless before. They're still clueless, not surprising. Show it to the expert now, and they're stumped. They don't know what to do. Why? Because things have changed, and their expertise isn't relevant anymore. Right? And unfortunately, in this complex, in this uncertain, in this dynamic world that we live in, all too often that's what happens with our expertise. A great study by a friend Heidi Gardner looked at consulting teams. She found under time pressure, the experienced teams did worse. Why? Well, it turned out the experienced teams, when they were under time pressure, they turned to the partner who was leading the team. Well, we don't have much time. We need to get through. There's you know, kind of emergency. We better go to that expert. Turned out that in those circumstances, it was actually the junior people who were on the ground, who were spending time with the client, who were best prepared to help solve the problems. But they weren't the ones being looked at. I did some work myself in uh, cardiac stints, uh, looking at uh, the FDA came out with some negative news uh, around certain stint types. We looked at what happened if you'd used it a lot versus not, right? Were you an expert? Uh, and the FDA brings out this news. You are much less likely as that expert to respond to the negative news. You dismissed it. You didn't change your behavior. You simply stayed dug in. And so the challenge is when we take this too narrow of a view of expertise, we don't appreciate, right? We need different experience for a different context. It may be around the task, but it may be around actually the customer. Or it may be in working with the team and the familiarity that we have with each other. 
or it may be success, it may be failure. Right? Experience is multidimensional, and all too often we end up ignoring that. Um, so that's our first problem around uh, expertise. Our second um, is that as we focus on experts, as I kind of foreshadowed a little bit before, we don't involve the front line. Right? My favorite kind of study around this was some work I did with a former doctoral student. Uh, and so he uh, was interested in uh, studying contract manufacturing. Uh, so uh, basically think, you know, the companies that make your iPhone, um, that uh, we had an in at one of those. So he went over for a summer uh, and was going to study how learning took place on the floor there. Now as he walked in, he had a problem, right? That turned out they had everything color coded. Uh, so uh, workers were kind of in their uh, unique colors. As a guest, he was given a different uh, garb. Uh, in addition, he didn't speak uh, the language. Um, and uh, as a male uh, Caucasian, uh, stood out a little bit compared to the mostly female uh, native Chinese population that was actually doing the job. And so he wandered around and realized that he was never going to learn anything here. But he had a really cool idea for how he could learn something. He was going to go back and he was going to get RAs and implant them in the organization. Um, company signed off on this. Um, he then kind of told me how he was going to recruit from Harvard undergrads, people who had grown up to at least age 12 in China, uh, to go spend six weeks working at one of these factories. Um, I don't think I laughed at him, uh, but I think uh, certainly I know in my head, uh, I kind of imagined this, yeah, good luck with that. You know, Harvard undergrads, I'm sure they're really going to want to do this. Turned out he got way more than he ever could. Uh, so uh, kind of huge interest in this. Uh, and he deployed uh, these young women to go into the factory, right? They entered the factory as if they had just been hired, right? 19 on average uh, year old Harvard undergrads working alongside. Um, once he did that, now they're in pink, now they can speak that same language. He found something really fascinating that turned out on the floor, whenever managers, whenever guests came down, people followed the rules exactly, okay? Again, not that surprising. When they left, they actually did different things. They followed different processes. Turned out, though, those different processes, they were better, faster, cheaper, higher quality. Right? <laughs> they were doing things better when nobody was watching. Um, why, as he got them to ask, well, it just wasn't worth their time. It was too difficult to run anything up the ladder. Right? They knew more than the organization was able to actually capture, and they were doing it. They weren't being lazy when you weren't watching. They were being more productive. He had a really simple intervention. In his case, he just put a curtain around them. He said, okay, we're going to give you some privacy. Right? We're not going to have this kind of transparency. With that little bit of privacy, performance skyrocketed. Now, I think it's also interesting to note, right, they did this intervention. It worked exceptionally well. The company didn't stick with it. The company ended up just trying to fiddle with incentives to see if they could get the same thing. They couldn't. Um, and so we could and should ask ourselves from a design standpoint, why is it so hard to give that little bit of privacy to folks when often it can be quite advantageous, as it certainly was here. That lack of the frontline involvement, though, manifests itself in setting after setting, right? Um, appreciating uh, that uh, you know, healthcare is another great place to look at this, uh, that you know, we really need to engage nurses in any improvement. Uh, and unfortunately, when we add on that busyness point, kind of when we're rushing from one thing to the next, then we do workarounds, right? We don't actually solve the problem. Uh, we simply come up with a way to progress. And so we have to think about not, yes, experts matter, but they can't be all of the story, right? They often have too narrow, view, narrow of a view of expertise, and they don't let us engage the front line. And so, right, how do we address this one as well? Um, you know, we can start with an organizational you break it, you fix it policy. Let's keep our problem and the eventual solution together in time, in space, and in person. Right? When something goes wrong, we fix it as quickly as we can. When something goes wrong, we fix it where it occurred. When something goes wrong, the person who broke it fixed it. Now, that doesn't mean that if you don't know what to do, we just say, yeah, sorry, you're on your own. Right? We have to provide resources to support folks, but we try to engage that front line because they know more, and also that keeps them from repeating it. Second is we appreciate this need for a portfolio of experience, right? that it's not just one thing. You know, it can be the task matters, it can be the education matters, but other things matter too. 
Yes, the weather I already talked about, um, that's rather probably less fundamental to this. Um, but things like your prior experience with folks. I've spent a lot of time looking at team familiarity, team's prior shared work experience. Turns out it's a very significant predictor of whether you're going to be successful as a team. Right? And it matters not just that everyone has worked together, even if just two of us have worked together in the team, we're more likely to succeed. Whether that's in software, whether that's in consulting, in healthcare, in the US Army, um, lots of different contexts we see that play out. So in our context, looking at our organizations and trying to understand you know, what is the experience that matters. I think the final part here is thinking about respect. Um, so uh, the smartest person I know, uh, met him in, uh, in grad school, part of the reason I know he's the smartest person uh, is that uh, he didn't stay being a professor, he went out to Silicon Valley to start a company uh, and has gone down that path. Uh, but in working with him I was always impressed that in whatever room he walked into, he had interactions with folks uh, that were clearly much less knowledgeable than him and yet were extraordinarily positive, that people left feeling good about it um, as apparently did he. And so one day I said, you know, hey David, can you explain this to me? It was another one of those moments when I knew that you know, he was the smartest person in the room, not me, as he kind of looked at me with a pained expression on his face. Uh, and he said, Brad, you don't get it. In any interaction, the other person knows more about something than I do. And so my goal is to figure out what that is and what I can learn from them. And so if we take that same perspective as we work with other folks, what do they know that I don't? What can I learn from in order to improve? Then we can actually overcome this bias around expertise. And so, you know, as we tie kind of all four of these together, we recognize that yes, in the short term, success is easier. In the short term, it's easier to act and do. It's easier to fit in. It's easier to turn to experts. But you know, we need to focus on the other side too, right? Making sure, hey, what is our failure rate as an organization? I love uh, kind of a bank that had an innovative unit. They set an explicit failure rate because they found too many of their projects were succeeding. They said, look, if we're this successful, we're not pushing the boundaries far enough, right? And so what can we do uh, to make sure we're pushing those boundaries? We're trying new things. That on action, yes, we have to do, we have to execute. We do have to sometimes just jump in and try. It's not that we want to be paralyzed by a fear of failure, but at the same time that we're taking that time to reflect before, during, and after. That on fitting in, yeah, you know, we can't push it too far, but that we're making sure we're engaging people's heads, we're engaging their hearts as we help them use their strengths. And then, again, we like our experts, they can help us, but we have more expertise within the organization than we realize, and so we want to activate that. Um, you know, in addition to uh, kind of talking this through today, um, as I mentioned, uh, kind of putting it all together uh, in a book uh, called uh, Never Stop Learning. Kind of the key premise of the book is that when it comes to learning, we're often our own worst enemy. And so as Margaret said, kind of an operations professor that draws a whole lot on behavioral science. And so interested in kind of what should we do? Why don't we do it? How can we do it going forward? Uh, which is uh, what I'm unpacking there. Uh, it uh, will be out this summer.